82-year-old Mary Salter lost her husband to Alzheimer's over two decades ago. He had a rare genetic and inherited form of Alzheimer's. He was only 43. It's hard enough to lose your husband at a young age, and while many are becoming caregivers to a mom or dad, or even a spouse, Mary is now care partnering with her son and daughter, both who have been diagnosed with this rare genetic form of Alzheimer's. Welcome, Mary Salter, to the Caregiver's Voice. Thank you, Brenda. I appreciate you having me here today. Thank you. And if you can step back, Mary, about two decades to when your late husband was diagnosed, how did your family initially discover his Alzheimer's? Well, it didn't actually begin with Bobby and in the process. Uh, his mother had passed when he was four years of age, and the medical records were sealed because there was a lot of strange things uh, with her memory getting lost. Basically, what she was doing was showing the signs of Alzheimer's, but back in the 50s, there was not anything that was diagnosed or even called Alzheimer's. So truly, if you look at the history, it began with the mother. Uh, wow, Mary, that, I mean, think about that. In the 1950s, way back then, when it reminds me of the time of when we'd still have what they would call mental institutions where people were oftentimes wrongly placed because people didn't understand this disease. Absolutely, and that's, uh, if it weren't for um, Bobby's father and the oldest sister taking care of the mother at home, that actually would have happened. And because of the stigma and not knowing what was causing her symptoms, her medical records were sealed. Wow. Her family did not know what uh, the mother had. All my husband knew at four years of age about his mother, what he could remember was when the door to the bedroom was opened, there was a bad smell. That's all a four-year-old knew about his mother. And obviously that was the continence going on. But she was kept at home and the family didn't know. And because of the stigma, they thought she had some kind of mental defect and it was never discussed and the medical records were sealed. Wow. And your own husband then was diagnosed with Alzheimer's or started showing the symptoms. How did he, how did he start showing the symptoms? There's a progression. There was five children born in the family. Uh, the first one um, uh, was 16 when the mother passed. The youngest was three. Um, there was a process that began with the oldest brother. He began to show very similar symptoms as to what the mother had displayed. And questions began to be asked by the wife. You know, uh, tell me more about what Martha, that was her name, you know, you guys talked a little bit about what was going on, and he seems to be displaying the very same or similar uh, symptoms that his mother did. Well, she went and had the medical records unsealed. And through that, they began to see the similarities in what their mother had been displaying, and now what Butch, the oldest, began to display on his own. So it went in, succe in succession. Uh, out of the five children, four inherited the mutation, all four boys. And so in a matter of a nine-year span, we buried all four brothers. And the um, Bobby and his younger brother, who were 18 months apart in age, were buried four months apart. What a burden for the family. And, and one yet was spared. One was spared uh, of this diagnosis. Was that the oldest, youngest? He was the oldest um, a female. Um, and it's not male or female dominant. It just happens to be, there's a 50-50 chance of inheriting this gene. And, and it, what is the gene, Mary? What is the gene exactly? The gene that the Salter family carries is called a PSN1 and it stands for Preslin 1. There are three, possibly a fourth one, they're now talking about being added to this list of, of genetic mutations that cause um, this uh, type of Alzheimer's. If you're a gene carrier, if you inherit that gene, 
your chances of having it and dying with it are 99.9%. That is just beyond scary because, you know, one of the things, there are statistics and then what is it? People say there are damn statistics. But when you say 50-50 chance earlier, um, that really means that, you know, in a family of four, say, that, that doesn't mean two will definitely have it. It just means every single person has a coin toss 50-50 chance of getting it. So all of them could get it or they could not get it, but it's a 50-50 chance of getting it. Now, uh, what percentage of people have this pre gene one that you talk about? And I hope I pronounced that correct. Preslin. 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 Uh, that I do not know because that's, you know, I'm, in our family, we know what we have and we do care about the other families that have a mutation. Um, but I, I've never asked Dr. Bateman that specific question. How many carry this? How many carry that gene? How many carry that? Because basically the different genes don't present themselves differently. It just happens to be where you're, um, where it is on a genetic scale. It doesn't, it doesn't make um, the time that you get it any different. It doesn't make the process that you go through any different. So I guess the percentage of people having X gene, X gene, X gene has never really been important to me. It's all about just a gene that creates this issue. Which has totally devastated your family, uh, your mom, mother-in-law, your uh, aunt or your uncles, your four uncles-in-law, if you will, and brother, I'm sorry, your brother, yeah, your four brother-in-laws, so uh, five people, and then you also mentioned there was a sixth person affected or dead passed from this as well, who was that? Um, was Butch, who is the oldest oh. of the brothers that got, it was his son, um, so because he had the mutation, of course, then you have that chance of passing it down to your children. And, and how old he had was Butch when Butch uh, died? Or no, not Butch. Butch. His, Butch's son. I'm sorry. Butch's son. This was Eric, and Eric was 37. When he, oh my. And now, now this has affected two of your three children, your own children. So, Mary, I mean, I sit here, and I just try to imagine you marry, you you know, this is all in your life, all been surrounding you all for a long time in your life. And this is not, yeah, and it's not an easy thing. It's intense um, in its, its uh, manifestation. So now two of your three children have this. And tell me about this. How did you guys discover this with your children? Well, um, once, once this was uh, identified and, the, all, and all of these uh, boys got this, we began to know more uh, of finding out that um, there was something to this gene, that the, there was an inherited gene. It wasn't just by chance that these four boys uh, got passed in the same manner. So I had, uh, when my husband passed, I had Duke University do a um, biopsy on his brain, and they held on to that uh, biopsy. But back then, Duke wasn't really big. There was not a lot of research going on. I just picked Duke because they were a large hospital. I figured if anybody could give me some answers, it was a shot in the dark, and I reached out to them. Nothing really came about from that other than they said when they did the biopsy, the autopsy on the brain, it was the worst case of scrambling that they had ever seen. And when I, when I discussed scrambling, in, in Alzheimer's you have t uh, tangles and towels. And tangles are, are microscopic and you cannot see them really with, with the human eye. But under a microscope, you can see it. So it would be like taking your Christmas lights, how they look when you take them off your tree at the end of the season and they're, you know, all together and... Perfect and you can't analogy. <laughs> and so they said it was the worst case of tangles. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the worst case of tangles for them? How many people with early onset brains had they biopsied? But, you know, at that time, I didn't know what to do with that information. I just knew 
He had the worst case of tangles. I knew what he died from, and whether he had the worst or whether he had the least didn't really make a difference to me because the end result was death. So then how did that, how did you take that, that early, because that's 20 years ago, and bring that to the present with your son and daughter, uh, and how long ago were your son and daughter diagnosed? When Eric, their cousin, passed away at 37, um, the alarm bells went off. I mean, we went into panic mode, we as a family. Actually, it was, it was my oldest son, Brad, that said, Mom, we, we, something's got to happen. We have to figure it out. Because now it was becoming more real to them. When they see a cousin who is in succession, you know, a child of one of the brothers, uncles that yes. had the disease. How many years ago did Eric pass? You said at 37, but how many years ago was that? I believe it's been about eight years. Eight years. Okay, so we know. Yeah, all right. Okay, so, no, it was, excuse me, i lying, because Brian and Carrie have been in um, uh, research for longer than that, and it was Eric's death that prompted me to find this program. Okay, so... We'll say Eric passed away 10 years ago, about. So I started looking for programs that um, were working with or looking for participants with early onset. And I came up with uh, a program and I called them and they were called Diane. And it ends for Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer's Network. Well, this program was in its infancy. We were waiting for the ink to dry on the paperwork to get started in this program because there's a lot of legalese behind that. There are people that are in this program that are not willing to stand up and say, this is what I have. They want complete privacy. Yes. They don't want their name or anything else. So all of that stuff had to, been, had to be put into legal terms and they had to make sure they could cover for the participants. So Brian and Carrie, this is my two. Uh, hold that up for a bit. Yeah, there. Aww. Thank you. Brian, Brian's 38 and Carrie's 37, Aww. and they're 18 months apart. So wow. um, Brian and Carrie and um, uh, Brad all decided to go into the Diane research. It was an observational study. And so, when, but before they could be accepted, they had, the, the um, Diane program had to know if they carried one of, or if their father carried one of the mutations. If, that they were doing research for. Yeah. Uh, we contacted the university and had to sign for the uh, specimen to be released. It was sent to Washington University in St. Louis, who, who does the Diane program, the only research program that does early onset for, these, for this type of inheritance. Um, so actually they're giving it a new name. They're giving it Younger Onset. Younger is, yes, instead of early, to distinguish from early stage to younger onset, yes. And you have two beautiful children I'm looking at there, and I thank you for sharing that picture with us, Mary. I appreciate that. So uh, when the specimen was sent and it was verified what mutation that um, the Salters carried, they were then accepted into the program. And so... Ten years ago, they began with they go for they went for a visit with lumbar punctures, PET scans, CAT scan. Uh, my, I mean, one test after another because these children, all of these participants from the Diane program, are a gold mine for researchers. Of course, um, because it, there is no question as to whether they have it. There is no waiting until they're sixty or sixty-five yes. years old to determine. So. The, the emphasis behind their participation in the program is these kids, and they are kids, they're my children, and um, they are children, you know, as far as an age for this disease. Yes. Are the key to the success of finding a cure for Alzheimer's. Um, they, they provide everything a scientist could ever want. They provide everything a neurosurgeon could ever need. They provide everything out there that is going to be the, the, the key to finding how to stop this monster. And beyond this, are they healthy in all other ways? Beyond this life, you know, it's a death yeah. sentence. They're healthy. Yeah. And, and so, 
let uh, uh, two things come to mind when you say this. Because with the Diane program, and this is something I've written about as well, because not the Diane program, but about being diagnosed, because we don't have a cure. So if we are diagnosed and labeled with having Alzheimer's or any other form of dementia, we have that label on us, and then insurance becomes an issue. So what are your two children doing about insurances now that they've been diagnosed, or were they able to get insurance before being diagnosed so that they're at least cared for? Oh, you're smiling. You're looking funny. <laughs> Mama bear. Uh, Mama bear. Some people look at me sometimes and think um, that what I did – uh, maybe it was somewhat heartless, but I knew prior, and I knew that exact problem. And keep in mind, we are being recorded here, so <laughs> I'm just... Let's just say, I, I took care of business. Okay, so you took care of everything okay. before they were even admitted in the program, before they were even diagnosed. You took care of things, which is a wise person for Mama Bear, and you said you're known in the dementia community as Mama Bear? Because I'll fight to the death for my. Always have. It doesn't. It doesn't have to do with dementia. It just has to do with my views and your babies and, and your babies. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So then, let's leave that for a moment, and then let's jump into then. Um, in in our remaining time, which is about six seven minutes, what uh, you as a caregiver? Because this is really for the voice, the caregiver's voice. You know, you are here, the caregiver's voice. What are some of the things that you do as a caregiver, care partner for your son and daughter as a mama bear? Well, ours, mine is probably a little bit different than most would, obviously, because of their ages. They're, you know, they're not as complacent and compliant as a mother <laughs> or father might be because they're still in their 30s trying to stretch their wings and you know, not let mom have control of their life. Um, and but which I, I have to uh, with Brian, I have to take care of his finances. He has um, now remember, you are being recorded. I just want you to know. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I do have to. I mean, I'm on his, uh, you know, so there are some things. Um, I did uh, immediately set up POAs, medical power of attorney, durable power of attorney. The children are both um, no artificial means of life, they are DNRs. So yes. those are some hard choices for, for no matter what age you're caregiving for. Have that so you've discussion. talked with both and both right now with their minds uh, as they are able to be functioning now. They are, and they're still higher functioning, but you guys have this discussion and you, they do not want to be resuscitated. They do not want, uh, yeah, so they, and you, you are now in the power of attorney. Are there attorney in fact for both of them? which means I need your permission if we choose to interview them in a, for Voices with Dementia column, I will need to ask Mama Bear's permission to interview them. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I should ask them, though, too. I think they still might yeah. have the choice in that, yes. They just kind of blow all that. Listen, they just did a speech in Chicago for the, uh, the Diane Conference um, Brian is exhibiting um, more um, examples of it you know, with a short-term memory, the confusion. He is living with me now, has been for a while. Carrie will be moving in next weekend. Not so much because she needs that little extra right now. Just there's some things going on. So um, as a, a caregiver for them, because they are involved in a trial drug, there's making sure the appointments are made, uh, that, that the um, uh, visiting nurses get here, that um, they have to go for MRIs every couple of months because the drug could cause brain bleeds. They have to go once a year to a different facility to uh, have these long, drawn-out weekly tests to see where they're going, if they're progressing, if they're digressing. So the caregiving, as you look, as you would say, most people are I'm not as deep into having to feed them, having to bathe them. Those will all come. And yes. This type of Alzheimer's that these babies have, I describe it as Alzheimer's on steroids because it's fast, isn't it? Seven years from onset to death. 
Yeah, so they've lived with it moderately for 10 years, but because it's been in your family, then you were, uh, pro- you were proactive in, in getting them involved in research. So as a care partner, and that's what I'll call you, not caregiver so much, because you're really their memory, your scheduler, making sure that they get to their appointments on time. You're the coordinator. You're their personal managers. Like they're the celebrities living with this disease, and you're their PM, their personal manager. So I'm going to ask you this because you still, we're smiling here and you are the mama bear, but mama bear, these are your babies. And I remember asking you before we set up this phone call, I said, you know, this got to be depressing. And you took it a step further and, and you really painted a vivid picture as you did with the Christmas tree lights earlier here just a few moments ago with the tangles in your late husband's brain. And you said, life has become a flat line. And that is devastating to hear, and yet that is your reality. So yet you smile and, um, you know, beyond these challenges of knowing that your babies have this disease, I'm imagining that you're finding joyful moments as well with your babies. Can you share that? Uh Uh-oh, there's a pause. (laughs) (laughs) You're pausing. Maybe we need to talk more about the challenges, huh? (laughs) Shut the TV off in Brian's room after he's gone to sleep. That's pretty joyful. No, Brian still, even though he is exhibiting some symptoms, has wit like I have never seen. Um, That's one of the things that his brother, who didn't get it, Bradley, um, who kind of suffers with um, issues because he didn't. Survivor's guilt. Survivor's guilt, yeah. And what did you say about um, Brian, that Brian, I I missed that. It kind of, I lost the, what you said. such a talent for wit. He can come back with a snap. I mean, things that you, it's it just like, you have to be with him. But one day we were walking and he, I guess, walked through a, a spider web and he says, okay, enough, Charlotte. You know, he, <laughs> Charlotte's web. Yes. He, he just always comes up with stuff like that. Um, but, you know, Bradley said, of course, all three found out their genetic status on three different years at three different locations. And when Brad and I walked out from the University of Tennessee, neither one of us knew how to feel because there was joy that he did not inherit. But you still had such a heartache over the fact that the brother and sister did. Yeah. He said, I would take this away from either one of them in a heartbeat, Mom, because I don't have that love for life. He said, Brian is a people person. Everybody loves Brian. Brian loves people. Brian loves life. Carrie's the mother of three. She now passes down a 50-50 chance to my grandchildren. And he said, I wish, I just wish I could take it from them because they have so much more purpose in life than me. And it's not fair that, you know, I should be the one not to get it when they're really the ones that should be going on. So, Mama Bear. Mama Bear, how does that make you feel to hear such unselfish love from your eldest for his two younger siblings? I mean, it's about time because that boy's done enough. <laughs> <to learn. laughs> well, okay, we'll leave that for now. I, I do, I do want to say one thing though. Your granddaughter, so Carrie's daughter Hannah. Um, which uh, she's underage right now, and I I hope we can mention her by name here in this recording. But she is honoring your family's legacy. She is honoring her mom's, her, um, her, her mom's legacy. She's honoring her dad's legacy, um, or her father, her grandfather's legacy. She's honoring her, uh, her, general family's legacy by entering the university, studying neuroscience, neuropsychology. Uh, I think that's tremendous because if this didn't happen in your family, what else could she be studying? You know, you just don't know what she'd do with her life. We never know. She actually wanted to be a vascular surgeon at one time. Wow. An orthopedic 
surgeon. And then as time has traveled, matter of fact, she was just asked to do, put in an application. Um, she's uh, starting a chapter at her high school for younger onset uh, and younger. And, and so they've asked her to fly to Washington um, in September to uh, be a part of um, going to the Senate and speaking to them. And so she actually was supposed to be going with her mother to St. Louis uh, for her yearly visit. But she said, Mom, you, you may have to be on your own. I've never been to Washington, and I need to go let them know what I think. So, wow. Uh, so and now she's, a, you, she's a national honor student. Every college that she's toured has a program that fits what she is wanting to do with her life. I, I need to tell you this. Um, I, it is such a pleasure to be able to have this opportunity to talk with you, Mary. I, I thank you, Mama Bear of Team Salter. Uh, we've run out of time, but we hope to have the opportunity to also interview Carrie and Brian, your children who now live with younger onset Alzheimer's. And because you are so willing to continue to advocate and share the message, and you say your children are because they are speaking out, for example, at uh, the Alzheimer's Disease International's recent conference in Chicago. And I, I just am so thankful that you are willing to share your message to inspire the world, to give people hope and the knowledge that they can do something, anything with this disease. Thank you, Mama Bear, Mary Salter. And thank you, Brenda, so much for taking the time and the effort to reaching out to me so that we can make a difference because many voices make loud noises. Mm -hmm.